Greetings from Tokyo, my dear, dear friends. This is Daisuke, and I very, very much hope that this video finds you well and in very, very good spirits wherever you are in the world. And today, if you don't mind, I would very much like to continue on with our journey, our discussions, our discoveries, and our explorations with respect to the recent releases made by the Criterion Collection during this year of 2022. That brings us to that title, which has been designated by Criterion under this release. That's Spy Number 1135. This release also happens to be the 4K UHD plus Blu-ray combo edition of this work from the year 1995. The name of the filmmaker is Carl Franklin. And the name of the work is Devil in a Blue Dress. This is the extraordinary, extraordinary work from the year 1995, and it is from that great artist, Carl Franklin, who is director and also screenwriter, the screenplay by Carl Franklin. It's based upon the original novel by Walter Mosley, and among its great, great cast, stellar cast, we have people like Denzel Washington and Don Cheadle and Tom Sizemore and Jennifer Beals and others. This is, of course, the work Devil in a Blue Dress. Courtesy uh, by Criterion, we have this, which is the 4K UHD plus Blu-ray combo release. It's an excellent release, by the way. Now, we will get to a little bit of a discussion about the presentation aspects a little bit later in this video, as well as the supplements. But first, uh, and, and the cover art design, which is really great. By the way, I'm, I have to apologize once again. I'm sorry for the reflection or the glare. I know it's a little bit hard to see. Uh, it cannot be helped. I'm, I'm afraid I'm really uh, apolo I apologize about that. But uh, for more information about the cover art and for better uh, high resolution quality pictures, etc., check out the Criterion website directly. It's really great. Uh, there should be a link down below. Uh, but before we go in uh, any further with regard to the supplements and technical specifications of this release, let us talk about the plot or story structure of Devil in a Blue Dress. And my goodness, there was so much here, so many layers, so many elements, so many aspects that seem to be combined into one uh, thrilling mystery entertainment, you know, oftentimes described with the phrase film noir or neo-noir, but I think there's room for a really nice, robust discussion that could be had about the categorization uh, in that vein, or whether other labels of category can apply as well, or maybe concurrently or at the same time. But in any event, one other element, one key element that we could focus in on is 1940s uh, Los Angeles, the milieu, the atmosphere, the setting, the period detail. And, uh, and in many ways, too, this can be said to be a very, uh, very quintessential Los Angeles picture because of the way it treats the landmarks. And uh, in fact, Carl Franklin and others do speak about the importance and the historical significance of a lot of the uh, depictions of Los Angeles at the time, both in terms of a social political current and, uh, that, uh, and also the, uh, the cultural current. Which has its, uh, which has its connections with uh, 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 migration, and has has connections with uh, the movement of populations uh, before and during and after the war, the Second World War, and also uh, the rise of certain movements of music, uh, jazz, leading into rock and roll, and that kind of uh, uh, cultural currency as well as other matters. Uh, and these details, these really great details and others are discussed in some of the supplements. So we'll get a little bit into that later. But that's one element, that's one strong element of this film. Against the backdrop of that environment or milieu or period setting, we have this story of our main character, or one of our main characters, we should say, uh, Easy Rollins, who's played with great uh, sincerity and earnestness and dignity and a sense of, of accessible nobility in a manner of speaking, in a great way, of course, by Denzel Washington. And we have his situation, which is presented to us uh, fairly early 
in the film in terms of certain obstacles that uh, that he has to confront having to do with his job or losing his job and having to do at the same time with trying to have him stake his claim of independence both uh, as maybe represented by or uh, symbolized by uh, his his care and his dedication to his property, his home, uh, the the house that he has, uh, right down to the way he cares for the garden and the yard, and how he cares for the uh, immediate vicinity and community. And so there is a, a calm or peacefulness or tranquility uh, in this part of the uh, of the story, and his own say uh, uh, trying to. Uh, uh, establish his own sense of uh, independence and also his sense of, of character and who he is as a human being. So against these various, say, backdrops, we have his story or the story being thrust into his lap, in a manner of speaking, wherein he has to or he is asked to try to find uh, a a person, uh, a mysterious person, and uh, this person has something to do with the Tom Sizemore character, it has something to do with maybe a high level uh, uh, politics, uh, there's an election, there's also uh, the rise of uh, certain uh, government figures or certain people who have uh, claims for uh, government aspirations and also missing persons and uh, also the uh, the uh, underworld, the underbelly, uh, certain connections with uh, uh, underworld figures, maybe, maybe not connected with each other, who knows. Violence ensues, uh, further missing persons, death, murder, and mayhem, and indeed a sense of chaos also emerges and arises. So this is all a type of swirl of a mystery which can be described or has been described as being maybe a film noir or neo-noir type of approach, although I think there's enough room, uh, wonderful room for, uh, for robust discussion and debate as to whether indeed the film noir uh, label or the film or categorization uh, really fits or maybe there are some other alternative or even parallel or concurrent uh, categorization labels that might be affixed to this uh, great great drama and that's one of the great things too there's a lot here because uh, I tried to explain in a very vague way to, in order to preserve the mystery for those who haven't seen the film that this is a detective story this is a mystery this is in many ways a type of hard-boiled detective thriller in uh, the great literary tradition uh, that has also been uh, 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 that has also been addressed and fully realized in the uh, in the writings of Walter Mosley which is of course the source material for this and so Easy Rollins is in many ways a type of detective or maybe a, a an emerging detective in a manner of speaking because as we know he is coming from a slightly different uh, uh, position in life at the very start and it's one of the ways in which this film is so fascinating is that how he evolves into this type of detective figure easy rollins and so uh there is that element of the film there's also many details uh you know let's take a moment also to discuss this type of hard-boiled fiction type of element it, it's it's very much a a almost a chandler-esque type of uh, of depiction because we have so many details, so many figures, almost seemingly random or maybe seemingly uh, uh, unrelated uh, fragments that seem to emerge. And it forms a type of network or a type of, of a confusing, in a, a wonderful way, in a purposeful way, a confusing ride through this almost, uh, uh, realm that is 1940s Los Angeles. And there are little clues that are, are, are uh, picked up along the way. Maybe the significance is not understood or not <clears throat> recognized until other pieces of the puzzle begin to emerge. And this is one of the great strengths of Easy Rollins and his journey through this, as I say, confusing swirl of people and places and things, uh, because we are in for the ride. And it's uh, thanks to the great charisma of our guide, who is uh, portrayed by Denzel Washington here, uh, that we as viewers are, are really into it. Now, one of the aspects of this, or another one of the aspects is uh, maybe a missing person, uh, maybe there is a person, there is a, a figure uh, who could, who may or may not uh, fall into the uh, uh, category of what is often described as femme fatale. Uh, of course, when we watch the film, we might see how that, uh, that might or might not apply. And uh, a figure known as Daphne Monet. 
and uh, one of the uh, one of the sort of um, uh, ways in which this mystery or detective th uh, thriller entertainment film kicks into gear is the uh, mission, as it were, to search for uh, this particular woman. Uh, where she is and who she is, we're not quite sure as of yet, although those details may slowly emerge as Yehisi Rollins uh, embarks on this mission, on this journey, on this uh, investigation, in a manner of speaking. Now, as I say, this is a detective thriller. It's a crime thriller as well, so there, is a, there are a lot of uh, scenes involving uh, crime and violence. Sometimes it's connected to the underworld or very... Uh, mysterious or suspicious characters or figures, sometimes uh, death and victims and murder, uh, murders uh, might be involved. And so that is part of the uh, detective uh, 1940s uh, hard-boiled, almost crime fiction type of, of uh, tradition that this film very comfortably sits in and thus uh, lends itself to also the, I think, a really applicable uh, a categorization of film noir as well. But but one of the great things, uh, great strengths of this is that on the one hand, it does try to turn these maybe uh, uh, points of expectation of the genre. It tries to turn them uh, in a way that is very surprising, sometimes very shocking, and also always uh, in order to serve the purpose and motivations of the character and thus the story. So there is a sense of a feel of the organic while uh, the storytellers are indeed giving us uh, these very, say, detective thriller types of, of aspects that we can come to enjoy for those who are uh, very comfortable in watching those uh, uh, films and reading those novels on the one hand, while at the same time giving us uh, quite a few, in fact, a lot of surprises that, may, that might uh, uh, lead us to uh, the unexpected. And that's how this film is also very entertaining. So it, it follows certain uh, genre conventions in a really wonderful and entertaining way and then twists them also in a really wonderful and entertaining way. And so that's why I'm trying to be a little bit vague as to whether or not this label might might apply or that label might might not apply. It depends on one's interpretation, it depends on one's reading of the film, and indeed uh, viewers might have multiple readings at the same time, which is again one of the great strengths of a film like Devil in the Blue Dress, as I was mentioning at the very start. It's a film that has many elements, many aspects to it. Now yet another aspect that one can say uh, with this is uh, the, uh, the, the way in which this film also has a social political currency. And I mentioned this at the start, we have 1940s Los Angeles and the historical context is very important for Carl Franklin and company. And this is also revealed in the special feature, features, excuse me, which is uh, the, uh, the African-American experience as uh, portrayed by the uh, various episodes of Easy Rollins' character. Now, there are moments where uh, Easy Rollins has to face a very, uh, very harsh and very, uh, very, uh, almost uh, uh, quite, uh, quite difficult uh, situations of of uh, race relations and racism uh, in the various communities that he uh, visits throughout the the film. And as a detective, of course, he has to, or he's expected to, visit many different people many different communities, uh, various strata of, of uh, class, uh, from the uh, very high uh, uh, upper classes, wealthy upper classes, and this is where we get into the, the high strata of the electoral politics of the, the period, and how this has a, a almost a, a political conspiratorial uh, type of uh, air to it as well, on the one hand, while he also uh, inhabits and visits and also frequents other uh, social strata. Uh, and uh, that is one of the great strengths of Easy Rollins. He's able to enter into various uh, communities, various groups, uh, while trying to get at the heart of the mystery. Uh, but, uh, you know, th this, this allows for the story to then explore these social political implications that have a lot to do with 1940s uh, race relations and uh, uh, implications and also uh, threats and uh, very uh, difficult and shocking and uh, terrible situations involving uh, acts of racism 
uh, that Easy Rollins and others do encounter. And this has to do with the almost the peripheral uh, uh, side elements of the plot, but also it may have to do with the actual central plot itself and how uh, race and racial relations uh, has, uh, in fact, a very significant point uh, throughout the proceedings from the beginning, middle to the end. With this discussion or with this uh, exploration or with the attention that this film gives to that those aspects of the film, we have much room for great performances from uh, all the performers and actors concerned. So uh, I mentioned, for instance, the great leading performance of Denzel Washington, who is again our guide, and he is our he is our detective. He is our hero, in a manner of speaking. But this is it, where the uh, story, the film, and also Walter Mosley's story or stories uh, also provide a very fascinating aspect. Is we also have another what we said to be another uh, uh, central character, that of Mouse. The character's name is Mouse, who's portrayed with such a wonderful flair and a wonderful, almost a playful volatility by Don Cheadle. Now, Don Cheadle and Denzel Washington then uh, form this combination or pair. Uh, they seem to be complementary to each other. One plays off on the energy of the other and vice versa. And so you have this uh, duo who have this history as characters, and we get a little bit of the backstory, the back history, of that. Uh, we get a little bit, but then there's stuff that's hidden, which maintains, against, uh, again, a sense of fascination that we as viewers have towards uh, not just these characters individual, but also the characters as they interact. And that interaction between the two of them is one of the, uh, one of the key strengths of this and the, the I think the, the great charisma and the great uh, uh, screen chemistry between uh, Denzel Washington and Don Cheadle is, is one of the primary aspects of what makes this very important relationship uh, succeed in a great way. And Don Cheadle, his performance, as I say, is unexpected. I said playful volatility, and that is, I think, uh, one way to describe the character of Mouse. And there is a, a sense of, as I say, complementary aspect, but also they are opposites in many ways, in many ways, which I think makes for then the furtherance of the strength of that combination itself. So, and that is also very much part of the, uh, the furtherance of the investigation of the plot going forward. And then we have other aspects of the mystery element too. So Tom Sizemore uh, coming in, he gives a, a real sense of, of uh, presence and also a sense of the rugged danger uh, that exists in the so-called outside world, that outside world that is entering in, almost invading uh, the world of Easy Rollins with this mission of a mystery of trying to find uh, this particular person that is out there, uh, that is of, uh, of interest to many groups of people that we will meet. Now, speaking of that person, so we have also a great performance by Jennifer Beals, who has a sense of elegance and mystery and also a sense of the unknown, and while uh, revealing, uh, very in key moments, revealing uh, aspects of her, the humanity of her character, which uh, goes to explain not only the motivations behind her character, but also perhaps the, uh, the important elements of the plot that will bring uh, us to the, and the characters indeed, to the, uh, sh uh, the, maybe the inexorable and shocking conclusion in a manner of speaking. So, and in many ways, unexpected conclusions. So, um, Jennifer Beale's performance is therefore very much, uh, very much important. And so all the performances here are combining to, again, give us this mystery, hard-boiled crime thriller a uh, detective uh, movie that is also a, a wonderful entertainment because it shows us uh, these episodes between and among these characters that are very likable with uh, the key relationship of, of Mouse and uh, Easy at the center. And then we also have the social political milieu, the backdrop of 1940s and also race relations and uh, class dynamics and social strata. And then also we have the Los Angeles feel, the Los Angeles milieu, the environment, the period setting, which makes this a quintessential Los Angeles crime thriller, a quintessential Los Angeles film. And then we have, of course, the great uh, embodiment of uh, performance and directing and style uh, uh, under the, the hand, uh, the directoring hand of the great Carl Franklin. What a film this is. It's so great to have this in the Criterion Collection under this wonderful release. So this is the film which is 
Devil in a Blue Dress. Devil in a Blue Dress comes to us courtesy of this great Criterion release designated by Criterion at spy number 1135. And this is the 4K UHD plus Blu-ray combo edition. So what that means is when you open up this plastic casing, you'll have two discs, uh, one layered on top of each other, although they don't touch, which is one of the nice things about this casing. Um, it is not a digipack. I know some people like digipack casing, but uh, the plastic casing here is okay for uh, purposes of of the uh, the compartment and the storage of the discs itself. And uh, I uh, took the liberty of removing, uh, prior to the start of this video taping, uh, the insert, which is a fold-out type. And I'm not a big fan of the fold-out type, but it has a great essay, and I'll talk a little bit about it. It's also got great paper, by the way. The, the uh, Lately, the, the use of paper uh, seems to be of a quality that I really appreciate. It's a, a minor detail, but again, uh, the the, uh, the devil is in the details, in a manner of speaking. So, uh, the reason why I have this here is uh, there is a note about the transfer. And let me say here that, and I quote, Devil in a Blue Dress is presented in its original aspect ratio of 1.85 to 1. Approved by director Carl Franklin, this new digital transfer was created in 4K resolution, uh, from the 35mm original camera negative. The 5.1 surround soundtrack was remastered from the original 6-track DME magnetic sources. On the 4K Ultra HD disc, the feature is presented in Dolby Vision HDR high dynamic range. On the Blu-ray, it is presented in high definition SDR standard dynamic range." End quote. So that is what it says for the transfer notes. Now, uh, as with the other 4K UHD combo releases from Criterion, uh, I watched the film on the 4K UHD disc, and then I watched the film on the Blu-ray disc, and I watched it also a number of times because there's also a commentary track that accompanies this. It's, a, it's an older commentary track. Uh, so that has been my experience with watching this particular release from Criterion, uh, just to give my uh, my bearings in terms of trying to uh, trying to get a sense of comparison in my head, uh, notwithstanding or despite my very very uh, how should I put it very amateurish and uh, ill-equipped way of looking at things, because I I am not so technically uh, savvy when it comes to the technical details of, of uh, presentation quality, etc., of uh, 4K versus uh, uh, 4K versus Blu-ray. But I do know just generally my own impressions, my own subjective viewpoint. And I must say once again, once again, that I am thoroughly impressed with the both releases, the uh, Blu-ray disc and also the uh, 4K UHD. So uh, I know that for some people, you know, 4K UHD is not the be all end all and people are very content and very satisfied with other, uh, other um, uh, physical media uh, formats like DVD or Laserdisc or VHS or Blu-ray and now uh, and then 4K UHD. So some uh, may not necessarily uh, need to purchase the 4K uh, release, uh, but you can still enjoy this film. And indeed, yes, the Blu-ray here is of great quality. The look and the sound to my eye is, is really quite sharp and clear. For the 4K UHD, however, I must say that this was a another type of uh, revelation for me when I watched the film. I, I, I And also in uh, exploring the supplements, I began to realize just how important the color and the mood and the look and the sound, because the the music and the uh, the way that is layered in is also important to uh, heighten the effect, as well as uh, provide period setting context, as well as also that social political flow of history uh, that is very important to Carl Frank Franklin in order to provide historical context is all here. And uh, I mentioned that in music and the sound, so you hear that very clearly uh, with the 4K UHD presentation. Also, uh, there's a, a way in which the the film uh, goes into these bright uh, sunlit shots of the outdoors, for example, and also deals with the the uh, the, sh the shadow and the darkness of uh, interior scenes. And sometimes those interior scenes 
uh, or ex maybe exterior scenes also, because there are a number of scenes that take place at night outside as well as inside. They are so striking in that there is a way in which the darkness and the shadow and the and the the the, the nighttime say nuance is preserved and uh, upheld in a way that is giving us a sense of the darkness on the one hand. It's very important to augment and to support the mood of those scenes. At the same time, there's so much detail and there is a type of way in which the, the, uh, the color palette uh, is really coming off the screen. And so I'm so struck by how much detail that uh, the eye can capture, my eye can capture, again, my very limited range eye can capture. I'm so struck and impressed by how much detail uh, one can see uh, even in the scenes of nighttime. And so uh, that is, again, very important, you know, because all this, this film is also about the period detail. It is about the, the little things. I mean, uh, there's a, a shot about, uh, there's an interior of a very ornate room of a wealthy individual, uh, a wealthy and highly connected individual sometime in the middle of this film. And it's somewhat dimly lit, the, the room interior itself. It's not overly, uh, overly dark, but it's, it's a dimly lit interior. And even so, there is uh, very much an important detail about the desk uh, that this person uses. And so you can get a sense, even from distant shots, you can get a sense of, of even the little details around that desk. And, so, uh, and it's also a, a type of hidden detail about who this character is in terms of his class, his wealth, and where he comes from, and what his concerns are. And it's also part of the mystery, too. Uh, so uh, it's, that's an example of where you can have uh, shots and scenes that are, again, of maybe depth and, uh, and uh, darkness. And yet you can make out so much, uh, which is so striking. And the colors, too. The colors, my goodness. Uh, even in this dimly lit world or this darkened world, you can see and feel and experience the colors. And again, the, the color palette is so important. Uh, reds and uh, reds and whites and also the uh, and uh, dark blues and browns. Uh, blue, of course, blue is a very key color. It's in the title itself, a devil in a blue dress. And so blue dress, uh, if and when it appears, it appears with a great sense of subtlety, but also a sense of uh, style and, and, uh, uh, and also being part of the world while also uh, uh, setting itself off in a way that still is remarkably noticeable under the, the care of these presentation. Uh, so the 4K UHD experience was a true utter delight. I was so impressed. And again, it helped me to uh, uh, watch this film and it became a revelation, this film was. So, uh, wow, wow. So uh, even if you're not into the 4K format, you know, the Blu-ray presentation I think is stellar, uh, but I continue to be so impressed with Criterion's 4K UHD offerings, including this, which is Devil in a Blue Dress. It's really wonderful. Now let's continue on with a discussion of this great Criterion release, and that brings us to the supplement section. Uh, so there are maybe we can call two categories of supplements. Uh, the second category we'll talk about in a moment, but the first category we can talk about is the commentary track. Now, this is a commentary track which is from 1998, and it is with the writer-director Carl Franklin. Um, so, this is a great, great commentary track. Uh, Carl Franklin is so well-spoken, and he's, uh, he is such a great artist, and yet, at the same time, he's so modest in the way he talks about his work and he's very straightforward and direct about what it was he was trying to achieve and uh, some of the things that he, he experimented with and some of the things he was really intent on doing uh, as well as a discussion of how this film is received, how this film is regarded, interpreted, etc. So it's, this is wonderful. If you have not heard this commentary track, uh, from Carl Franklin, again from the late 1980s. Please, please do so. It is, it holds up so well. I mean, it has no sense of, of uh, having been aged or anything at all. It feels so timeless and it feels like, it feels like it, 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 it could have been a recording from uh, yesterday. It's just, oh, it's so great. It's so great. So, um, for example, uh, he does speak about the opening credits, uh, Archibald Motley, and he speaks too about how he was thinking about different ways of approaching the film, but one way to do it uh, and the ultimate 
a way that this film does open with the opening credits is through this uh, uh, traveling through this painting or um, this uh, this depiction, this artistic depiction, which is in many ways, I think, uh, part of the discussion of whether or not this film could be described as film noir. Is this film noir or not? There are plenty of uh, reasons and there are plenty of arguments that can be made that, that would say that this is a film noir. And indeed, those arguments, I think, are very reasonable indeed. But there's also a reasonable argument to be made that this film... Uh, is not necessarily film noir, or maybe to put it in a in a more uh, a more uh, uh, how should I put it? A, a, a way that might uh, be more suitable. Uh, there could be the argument or the discussion to be made that there could be other ways of looking at this film other than film noir. And I think this discussion point by Carl Franklin at the very start about the opening credits speaks to this. In other words, it could have been a quote unquote film noir type of opening. Uh, with uh, uh, this uh, text over a uh, darkened night setting, mysterious setting or something like that. But uh, he chose not to go that route. Instead, he went with this depiction of this painting and various figures in this painting. So that serves, again, the focus on culture and art. That is very much part of this film. Again, it's also linked to the period details, 1940s Los Angeles. And also it then reinforces that notion how the perspective or one of the key perspectives from Carl Franklin and company is to look at this film and look at this work and regard it as a, a social political uh, discussion uh, with this storyline as its uh, uh, focus base. So well done. This is uh, really quite uh, quite wonderful indeed. And also he speaks to, this is also a great uh, way in which he enters into a discussion of the music. Um, and uh, West Side Baby and uh, T-Bone Walker and also other pieces of music that appear throughout this, this work, which allows him for a discussion about how uh, this is also a film which is talking about the transformation or flow, historical flow uh, from past to... Uh, the uh, contemporary present times of the film. And one of the ways that, uh, that Carl Franklin is trying to do this is through jazz and rock and roll, or jazz making its connections with what might end up being rock and roll of, or the, the, uh, the, the currents of rock and roll uh, established in mid to late 40s and then going into the 1950s. So, uh, great. And then also we go into the film, there are some outdoor street scenes that are just... They're classic, classic, the way that period is captured. And there's just little details about uh, the people that walk through. Um, and those details, and they go by really quickly, but those details, it's discussed a little bit here and also a little bit elsewhere too. How, uh, for instance, you see a someone carrying a, a box of uh, what looks like, uh, you know, supplies or, 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 or you know, farm-related things. And so this is a reminder, too, of, of uh, movements of population from certain parts of the country into uh, urban centers, into places like uh, uh, the big cities of the time, including Los Angeles. And so you have movements into uh, this, and you have, therefore, a reflection of many people from many parts of the country that are located in this one central location as uh, depicted in this street shot that we see at the very outset. It's very classic and you see the period detail, but you see many people coming forward. So it's almost like this, this uh, crossroads of, of uh, different uh, cultures from around the United States uh, coming together again in terms of the migration routes, uh, the internal uh, migration routes from uh, parts of the country into uh, the city centers. Now, those migration routes also see a reverse effect because sometimes we see in this uh, film how some characters or some uh, characters that or some people that Easy Rollins meets leave the city and go back home uh, because uh, maybe the, there aren't any enough opportunities uh, found to be found here. Of course, Easy Rollins tries to make do with what it is he has and he's trying to build it and uh, and support it and uh, trying to establish it. And, and we see that as uh, uh, in the great uh, sort of direct dealing as well as a great metaphor of his house and the yard and trying to uh, plant the trees and all this. So uh, a lot of historical detail that is packed already into the frame. And it, it's not so, it's not so like, uh, how should I put it? It's not so in your face. Uh, it's very much subtle, but it's also very much there. So, uh, uh, and it, these details and more are revealed, uh, for instance, in this great conversation commentary track from uh, writer-director Carl Franklin.
And also the idea to it that's embedded in this commentary track is the way in which this film handles the American dream or the concept of the American dream or what might be in, in the hands of some characters or what happens to some characters, the American nightmare in a manner of speaking, but how people like Easy and others and Mouse and others try to uh, confront it and handle it and deal with it and maybe uh, uh, make a claim. Uh, to the American dream on their own terms, which is one of the reasons, too, why these characters and their great independent streaks are so appealing and so uh, so attractive for uh, viewers and many fans around the world. Uh, so, And uh, just talking, too, about the period details, photo references are made, uh, great comments are made about the photography, director of photography, Tak Fujimoto. Um, also, yes, uh, symbols here. Uh, there's a sense of the film having maybe a cinematic Western uh, aspects to it. He, uh, there's a scene uh, somewhat early where Carl Franklin does talk about uh, Tom Sizemore and how he has a, a look of a, of a Western uh, saloon setting and he, as he enters and he brings the mission, as it were, so that uh, that has this great cinematic uh, bearings to it, which also is another element I mentioned to this film is a combination of elements. There's another element to the, 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 the way in which it, it handles many different genres. Um, also to the social political current and the currency, uh, Carl Franklin does talk about the experience of African Americans like Easy Rollins. Uh, in certain areas that he travels to in the, in the city, uh, say he runs into some trouble because of that, and this is um, uh, the scenes involving like um, uh, Santa Monica or Malibu during the time there. Um, there's specific scenes that involve a uh, nighttime setting and, and characters that he meets. Uh, so there's uh, elements of segregation that we are reminded of. There's elements of race relations and racism that we're reminded of. Race identity, which is uh, we are also. Uh, uh, we also are uh, experiencing as viewers because the characters are experiencing them and they are very, very much linked directly to the uh, the propulsion of the plot forward. So uh, th this is, uh, this is uh, yeah, very, very important indeed. And then he talks more in the commentary track about the performances, uh, Don Cheadle, Jennifer Beals, Denzel Washington. Speaking of the performance, for example, Jennifer Beals, he does reveal Carl Franklin does about uh, the say the process by which Jennifer Beals was uh, ultimately chosen for this uh, very important role, and uh, he does talk a little bit about uh, uh, certain say considerations that he had to make uh, because maybe the casting and I don't want to get into too much detail here, but maybe the casting uh, could have had some implication about how. Uh, how viewers uh, would have uh, perceived the mystery element, which her character is a very uh, a crucial part of. And so uh, he made those considerations, but uh, ultimately, and ultimately, he also uh, made considerations about her performance and screen presence. And once again, I must say, Jennifer Beale's screen presence here and her performance is, it's, it's so right. It's so right. There is a, there is a, a, a cool exterior, uh, of a level or layer that maybe could be said to be hiding some kind of vulnerable, emotionally vulnerable ex interior. Uh, and that dichotomy, that uh, almost a, a, a contradictory clash, if you will, I think is very much embodied so effectively in her performance. And indeed, it serves as a type of metaphor for many things that, again, are very integral to the plot. Uh, and then talking about Don Cheadle, too. Don Cheadle is the character of Mouse. Uh, and uh, how. And this, this will also be brought up a little bit later in, in some of the other supplements here. Uh, Don Cheadle. Uh, such a... Such a... Wow, what a great, great performance here. Uh, it's... It, uh, it comes in, uh, in at a certain timing of the film, uh, and uh, when he arrives, there is this uh, like uh, burst of energy that emerges, so it's really great. And speaking of bursts of energy, we get that sustained presence of Denzel Washington here, so there's, there's more discussion of how great the performance of Denzel Washington here is, and others, and so... Uh, and then also uh, 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 homages and allusions and references. Uh, Carl Franklin mentioned specifically The Big Sleep, which is really quite wonderful, uh, and the L.A. geography. There's also a little, uh, little a, a typo, a misprint or a spelling error that he acknowledges in one of the newspapers that's 
uh, featured in the film, and so he acknowledges that. Uh, but he says it's okay. It's okay. It's it's uh, it couldn't be helped. And so he he acknowledges it while being very frank about it, and also being very uh, just uh, very almost uh, modest about it too, which is also I think a great indication of the type of perspective and philosophy he has as a, a cinema artist. Really great, great commentary track. So this is the commentary track from uh, ninety eight, uh, Carl Franklin's commentary track. So please listen to it if you haven't already. It's really wonderful. But that's not all because the Criterion Collection also has a section, a section of supplements, which can be found on the Blu-ray disc. There's a supplement submenu, and so you can access that through the Blu-ray disc, and there you will find a number of great supplements. And so what are they? So the first one is a 2022 discussion between Don Cheadle and Carl Franklin, which is approximately 36 minutes. And uh, this is really great. Of course, we have the two of them who have a, a wonderful uh, uh, personal and professional relationship. And they speak a little bit about how they knew each other and their background and indeed connections prior to their working on Devil in a Blue Dress. Uh, AFI thesis film is mentioned, for example. And also, uh, this also provides a nice and very, very refreshing uh, discussion about the character of Mouse and how Don Cheadle himself admits that maybe he didn't feel at the outset anyway he didn't feel like he might have been uh, a good fit for the character of Mouse that was it was depicted and created by Walter Mosley the author and also he mentions too there was an age difference between Don Cheadle himself and Denzel Washington uh, so that might have been uh, perceived as being an initial obstacle uh, to Don Cheadle's uh, ability to perform uh, because of the fact that they need to be, the characters needed to be uh, contemporaries in terms of age. Uh, but how is this going to be overcome? Well, it was overcome uh, and then some because we have the wonderful acting performance and nuance from both Denzel Washington and Don Cheadle in order to quote unquote bridge the gap of their actual age difference uh, so that on the film or in the film itself you can feel that they are uh, they are of the same or similar age or generation so um, they, they have a sense of contemporary in nature they are contemporaries so uh, although they do respect one another and they do listen to each other uh, and also Don Cheadle then inhabits the role of mouse so well I mean there is this danger and uh, almost violence to the character, uh, which is almost also, it's, it's very scary on the one hand, but it's also very amusing. And there are comic touches as well. And this is also brought up a little bit as well, how comedy is uh, used and applied with great effect and also uh, used to uh, make different aspects of the mood of this uh, scene in question, but also embellishing and uh, further illustrating the great dynamic between the two main characters here so easy and mouse so, so that discussion is is great and so and then you you watch the film you think wow don Cheadle is this character of mouse so, uh it's it's a wonderful wonderful role and then there's discussion too about carl franklin's depiction and his hope of trying to depict la uh central avenue uh the the the, the historical context, jazz and rock and roll, uh, the mid to late 1940s, uh, 1948. And also he's talking too about his, the importance that he had in terms of depicting aspects of Los Angeles. Um, and uh, uh, he's talking to, again, I mentioned this detail about the, the, uh, the, the background and someone carrying uh, some farm items uh, here. It's chickens. He says chickens in carrying a cage or a box. Uh, and how this is an indication of the rural, mi rural, excuse me, rural migration uh, roots into uh, the city centers like Los Angeles, and you have that distilled in this one shot. You have the like the whole of you have uh, the whole of U.S. history distilled in this one shot. It's amazing, absolutely amazing. Um, and uh, talking about uh, casting decisions, uh, Mel Winkler's Joppy, Jennifer Beals, uh, and Tom Sizemore. Um, and also, I, here, I was mentioning it earlier, uh, the discussion here, whether or not Devil in a Blue Dress is a film noir film. And so uh, this is a great area where uh, the two of them and have a, a nice robust discussion about this. And again, it could go either way, I think. And Carl Franklin, I think, is of the view that uh, for him, uh, there were the social realism elements to the film. And that's not to say that social realism is not 
it, it, it's uh, that's not to say that social realism is antithetical to the way in which film noir has been treated over the course of, of cinema since say the golden age up to the present day it's not to say that at all there aren't antithetical elements per se but uh there is something to be said about how uh the uh the the, the type of feel or or um characteristics of film noir are shall we say existing while at the same time there are multiple possibilities of interpretation including uh, looking at this as a historical period film uh, dealing with the social uh, cultural elements uh, that are experienced by uh, Easy and uh, by um, uh, Mouse and others uh, and so uh, uh, so I, I like that conversation very much and again it's uh, it's an indication to of how multifaceted uh, film like Devil in the Blue Dress is uh, and uh, it's also a coming of age story, which I like. Easy's coming of age story, in a manner of speaking, because he doesn't start out as a detective, a professional detective. He starts out in a completely different circle of life, but uh, he uh, or aspect of his uh, life and his uh, his uh, situation. But then he gradually, or maybe not so gradually, uh, transitions into the role of the detective as we watch the film progress, so it's uh, really, really wonderful. Uh, also, going back to uh, depictions of Mouse, because of uh, Don Cheadle's discussion here, details about the, the dress and the fashion sense, things that, what would Mouse, character like Mouse, wear? And that, that was depicted in the, all the way down to the shoes, what shoes were being chosen. Uh, and also, the, and mentioned too about the humor. There's a a, a type of a humor that is, has a very almost sinister edge to it, as well as being very funny. So you know things about the way that he uses his guns, uh, and I say guns in the plural. So uh, uh, and also talking too about Carl Franklin and his background. He also has a background as an actor, as well as a, a, a director and, and writer. So. Don Cheadle then, uh, uh, this gives the opportunity for him to, to uh, uh, sing the praises of uh, Carl Franklin about how well he's able to work with actors on set uh, to, as he puts it, eliminate the fear of the performance in order to give the actors enough of the comfort zone they need in order to uh, make those risks and to uh, go out on a limb and really uh, give those grand flourishes of performance that are, are, are definitely there. So... Uh, and also he's talking too about um, uh, the uh, uh, gangster cinema, gangster movies, uh, and also looking at this film as a period piece, as a historical film, as a film that's talking about social, cultural, and political currents uh, in the context of a historical film. So I love these aspects. Again, a further... Uh, support and uh, justifications for various potential readings of this film, Devil in a Blue Dress. And, I, and let me just say here on a personal note that, you know, I, I, I've I, seen this film a number of times, but I was, uh, I, I never, I never was able to read these various multiple interpretations of the film, Devil in a Blue Dress. I never saw it uh, I, for instance, I never saw until recently, you know, these social, cultural, political currents uh, that can be, that are definitely there. I never saw it necessarily as a, as a Los, Los Angeles film, a quintessential Los Angeles film uh, necessarily. But with the help of great releases like this uh, release by Criterion, I'm able to, again, uh, uh, re-watch it for the first time in a manner of speaking. Uh, which is also uh, what I mentioned earlier about how this watching this release here is like a revelation. I've seen the film a number of times before, but watching it this time was like a revelation. And one of the reasons I felt that way was also looking at the different uh, ways of interpretation as it's discussed here and elsewhere. So well done, Criterion, for doing this. I love this. This is a, uh, a, the conversation between Don Cheadle and uh, Carl Franklin, approximately 36 minutes. It's really great. And that's not all because maybe in conjunction with that, we also have uh, Don Cheadle's screen test. And this is also, this is described, I think, at the very end from 1995 or copyright 1995. And approximately totaling 30, I'm uh, sorry, 13, one, three, 13 minutes overall. And uh, so it's, it's lovely to see this. We have Don Cheadle uh, just working through. Uh, the the craft and getting the details down there is a sense of the youthful exuberance of mouse coming through even in the screen test or, or behind the scenes footage uh but there is also a sense where he, there's a youthful exuberance but he's never he's never um overwhelmed or the character of mouse is it's not a character that is quote unquote too too big for uh too big for the clothes that he's wearing you know what i mean in other words 
he has the character that is so uh uh it's 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 wonderful it's loud it's big it's it's outrageous it's audacious and it should be and he definitely matches it uh matches it uh, uh inch for inch uh, in the performance it's a grand great performance and you see that already in the screen test here so it's wonderful that it's included again because mouse 2 is such an important uh, a very important significant character so that's great to have this so this is the screen test don Cheadle screen test approximately 13 minutes and that's not all because then we have a another supplement which is described from 2022 it's a criterion supplement again this is totaling 25 minutes and this is a discussion between attica law and walter mosley and uh, this is talking about the sort of the writings of walter mosley and the the literary uh, the literary origins, if you will, of uh, the character of Easy and Mouse and others, and the story Devil in a Blue Dress, which is, uh, as uh, we know, which is one of many uh, novels uh, in this series of novels that's dealing with this uh, this very fascinating set of characters. And so, uh, so uh, this is the discussion, or, or one of the great elements of the discussion. And I love the way it starts. You know, Attica Locke is is is. Uh, uh, again, singing the praises of Walter Mosley and, and, and thanking him for the great example that he set. And it was his great example that allowed for a number of writers, herself and others, to uh, write in the same or similar vein. And so Walter Mosley, uh, but Walter Mosley reacts in such a, a great and modest way. It's, it's really lovely. The interaction between these two artists, is, it's uh, fantastic. And so uh, this is then the opportunity for uh, Walter Mosley to talk a little bit about Devil in the Blue Dress, you know, his debut and the, and the, the debut story, if you, as it were. Uh, and we get, uh, and this is also, uh, it, it, it's a film that we learn about later. It could have been a series of films, or at least that was the hope of Carl Franklin, Walter Mosley, and others. It didn't quite pan out that way, unfortunately, but, oh gosh, there were so many, or there are so many books that could have been uh, like the series, you know, it was like, uh, it was. it's mentioned a little bit later in another supplement, but it could have been like Ian Fleming and the James Bond books that ended up becoming a series of films. It could have been like that. It, it's, uh, uh, one could only uh, speculate uh, as to what might have, what, what have, oh, it would have been so great if we had a number of films uh, in this universe. But be that as it may, we have still this great, great example, uh, Easy Raw, uh, talking about the character of Easy Rollins, talking about the character of Mouse, um, and also talking about Walter Mosley and how he, he started out and how he ended up becoming a writer. He mentions how he didn't quite uh, get into writing f of, uh, in full force until around his, uh, his uh, 30s. And, so, and then uh, the rest, as they say, is history because he has left behind such a great, great body of work uh, that is still alive and, and well to this very day. Wow, wow. And then uh, uh, then speaking to about uh, other inspirations, um, uh, film noir, hard-boiled detective fiction, Emile Zola, uh, and also the idea too about maybe talking about a community and various aspects of a community uh, that might have been the inspiration of Walter Mosley in this universe, but then it ended up being focusing in on the, the character of Easy and Mouse and others uh, for this series of films, and also other uh, literary and uh, artistic inspirations. Uh, Chester Himes is mentioned a little bit here. Um, Hard Boiled Fiction, as I mentioned, is also mentioned here. Um, and uh, then he's speaking too about how the, the details to about how this, uh, uh, the book ended up becoming the subject matter of what ended up becoming the film in the hands of uh, the writer-director, Carl Franklin. Uh, they do mention Carl Franklin's uh, other work, which is uh, One False Move. Uh, and you know, just one one brief moment, but please forgive me for the indulgence here, but uh, One False Move is is one of the, uh, it, it's, uh, I, I cannot stress enough how important that film was to me, One False Move, Carl Franklin's One False Move, when I saw it on VHS tape many, many years ago, and I was so mesmerized by it, and then the, the, the feeling of being mesmerized 
was continued with other works like Devil in the Blue Dress, but uh, they do mention that and uh, how uh, it was uh, a sign for things to come. And uh, we have Carl Franklin, of course, uh, forming and creating this really indelible work of art that is Devil in the Blue Dress. And also talking about the art of writing a screenplay. You know, Walter Mosley is very frank and very honest about you know, writing novels versus writing a screenplay. And he acknowledges it's a different type of art and so he might have expertise in one art over the other, uh, which is also his way of saying he really respects uh, the work of Carl Franklin, what he was able to do uh, with, the, with the story and fashion it into the story that ended up becoming the film. And then uh, this is a great way into talking about the casting. Don Cheadle is mentioned. Uh, Denzel Washington is mentioned. Uh, and then he talks to, uh, the two of them here, talks, talks about, this is great, the combination of the two characters, Easy and Mouse, uh, according to Walter Mosley. Uh, easy is the star, but Mouse is the hero. Wow, that is, that's, that's uh, very, very significant, I think. It, it's a lot of food for thought as one is watching this and indeed reading the, the novels. And he also talks, too, about uh, there's, this is not a story. This is uh, then uh, his way of saying that this is not a story about anti-heroes, uh, which might be one way that this film could be set off in a way from, say, hard-boiled uh, traditions or even uh, cinematic experiences, film noir traditions. But again, it depends on, on the mode and stylings, of course. But he's also talking about the importance of the depiction of, of what they call the black experience, you know, African-American experience. Or this is also very, very important in the writings as well as the film um, and uh, the history, the great migration, as well as other aspects of the, the, the great film itself, uh, the performances, Tom Sizemore, Jennifer Beals are mentioned as well. So uh, this is, uh, and the, the, again, the, 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 I don't, again, I don't want to get too, into too much of it, but uh, the aspect of the performance of Jennifer Beals, which is uh, in many ways, uh, a kind of, uh, there are some details about uh, Jennifer Beals that uh, could have some uh, ramification or significance about how we as viewers uh, uh, regard uh, the character that she portrays. And so they talk about this. Carl Franklin talks about this in the commentary track. He also talks about it in the discussion with Don Cheadle. And also here, uh, we have the discussion here. So there are various perspectives on this, which is so, so fascinating. Uh, so uh, that and other reasons, uh, please check out this great conversation, Attica Locke and Walter Mosley, approximately 25 minutes. It's really, really great. And that's not all, because then we get a, a Noir City Chicago uh, uh, screening of the film uh, Devil in a Blue Dress. And this is before the screening, a little bit introduction, and then there's a bit of a Q&A and discussion after the screening uh, in Chicago. And this is with Carl Franklin and Eddie Muller. And uh, uh, gosh, uh, uh, kudos to Eddie Muller, who's standing on the stage there with this huge cast on his foot. And there's no chair, at least at the start, and there's no chair. He's standing there, uh, but uh, he's standing there with the cast. And so then, and then uh, Carl Franklin joins him on stage at the very start, prior to the screening. And then afterwards, uh, they have a, a more relaxed uh, Q&A session. So this is at the Music Box Theater in Chicago for the Noir City Film Festival there, August 17th, 2018. Um, and uh, so they talk here about the details and uh, how Chicago is very important to Carl Franklin, as he says here, because I mentioned the film One False Move. You know, it, it had a very limited uh, path of distribution. You know, it, it could have been that maybe it wouldn't have gotten a lot of attention had it not been for how uh, some very high profile critics like Siskel and Ebert, who, of course, have this Chicago connection, championed the film to the extent that it was uh, that got. Uh, a lot of the attention uh, put on the film such that now Carl Franklin is able to to have a I mean it, it, it really gave him so much clout and so much of, uh, of inspiration and uh, so and it made it had uh, meant that a lot of people were able to see the film because the distribution channels were then uh, widening for him so was, uh, so he has this great uh, an emotional connection uh, with Chicago via that uh, very heartfelt uh, call out to Siskel and Niebuhr. Uh, and then he's talking about Jonathan Demme and Denzel Washington and coming together and, and that being part of the reason how this film got made in terms of the of the sort of the backstage politics of, uh, of Hollywood filmmaking at the time, you know, 1990s. Um, and also uh, the idea of the period feel of the film at the same time having a, an element of social realism. 
uh, and also talking to about um, uh, the score um, uh, and uh, uh, Roger Corman, AFI, Denzel Washington, uh, the cool factor of Denzel Washington here. Uh, and these are addressed in a lot of the uh, questions, and again, in the question uh, answer period, the Q&A, that's the, the latter half of this. So uh, really great stuff. Uh, this is approximately 25 minutes total. So uh, please check it out if you can. It's, again, more opportunity to hear from uh, writer-director Carl Franklin. The more opportunities you get, you know, uh, take advantage of it because he's really great to listen to. So uh, this is the, uh, the screening uh, from 2018. And then the supplements are then rounded out with the trailer. Uh, another great trailer for this. So that's the supplement section for Devil in a Blue Dress. All right, so with that, let's look at the way in which this has been released. So uh, you have this wonderful artwork. And again, this is very reminiscent about how the film opens uh, and the way in which it treats and handles art, even in the opening credits and also the use of the color palette. And in particular, the color blue is very significant. It's right in the title. Uh, but we have these wonderful details that really evoke and show the sense of period. So let's see here. The art is credited to art director Sarah Habibi and Eric Skillman. Illustration, James Ranson. Uh, so uh, uh, design, Eric Skillman. So I love this, this detail, this period detail and the font that's used as well. Again, I apologize so profusely for the glare on this. I'm, I, my presentation skills are... Uh, Terrible, terrible. Uh, but uh, please check it out on the website of the Criterion Collection or other sites online. You can get real high resolution uh, pictures of this great, great artwork. Now, um, this artwork or this art motif is carried on through into the uh, fold out. Uh, again, I'm not a big fan of the fold out, but I must say it has a great combination of pictures and stills. And I love the font use. I, I just, oh, it's cool. So, so cool. And the use of, again, the color palette's great. And the essay, Crossing the Line, Julian Kimball's essay, Crossing the Line. Uh, another great one. Once again, it does go into certain details of theme and, and uh, the concerns of the film, as well as the, uh, the background and history of the, the making of it, Carl Franklin, etc. So uh, please watch the film first. Once again, please watch the film first, and then you can watch or read this great essay called Crossing the Line. It's really, really worth it. Also, just, oh, gosh, love this. Love this. Oh, what a great, just, oh, these pictures. So wonderful. So you just, uh, you can uh, enjoy these aspects of the film. Uh, and again, uh, again, would be nice if they, if Criterion does uh, staple booklets for all of its releases, but uh, I can't complain too much, especially when you have something with a nice essay and a great presentation uh, in this package. So uh, this is the uh, release by Criterion of Devil in the Blue Dress in this 4K UHD plus Blu-ray combo, which I have on the table. It is stellar, stellar, stellar. stellar. And again, this release helped me to look at this film from a different light, a different perspective, or various perspectives I had never considered before. Uh, and so that created such a learning experience while at the same time being so thoroughly entertaining on many levels. And that's the great strength of this film. I'm so glad it's in the Criterion Collection. Carl Franklin in the Criterion Collection. Fantastic with this film. Devil in a Blue Dress. Okay, my dear friends, so that's it for now. And so until we meet again, please be happy and healthy and well. And please keep on watching a lot of great, great movies. Thank you so much, as always, for your time. I very, very much appreciate it. Stay strong, stay safe, and cheers.